Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for those songs, Tony. I always enjoy um, singing Christmas songs, and it seems like rather quickly we're out of past the Christmas season, and then we're not sure should we keep singing them or not. So I enjoyed that, and I was blessed by the songs that you led. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you. Lord, thank you for this Lord's Day. Thank you for the time that we can have to worship. And Lord, even as we worship in song and are reminded again of, of your gift to us, to this earth, sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, we're grateful for that. And I pray that as we are together this morning, that our um, time of reading your word and and studying that, that we would be strengthened and encouraged, and that you would be honored and glorified through it. Bless each part of this service here. Be with Brother Ken as he preaches up in Elkhart. I pray that you would bless their service also, and I pray that you'd be glorified through it. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. This is... We're entering the uh, Christmas season, and it's a busy time of the year. And as we, as you go out and shop, probably many of you um, have experienced waiting in line at a checkout. And there's a, a mother with a small child ahead of you, possibly. And... Um, the child is quite adamant that they want something or they don't want to do something or they're not happy about the situation. And you, and there's a lot of screaming and maybe begging and pleading and sulking and, and uh, whatever it may take to convince uh, the parent to give in to the child. And this parent may at first refuse or say no or say, uh, no, we're not going to get that or please sit still. But eventually a child that is persistent like that tends to convince the parent. And finally, in exasperation, the parent says, okay, I'm just, I'm sick of it and sure, go ahead and, and get this or do that or it gives in in some way. And maybe not hopefully not to that degree, but in some ways, you as parents or for myself as a parent, you know, I, f I find that there have been times that, that I, I kind of get to that point where I'm just, I just finally give in just for the sake of peace. You know, maybe we don't want to, maybe we don't stoop to the, uh, the statement of I'm, I'm sick of you or I, I hate this or whatever we hear in the checkout line sometimes that parents tell their children. But maybe we sometimes make comments that, you know, I just need a break or I, I, would, just, I would just like to leave or I just, I just wish I could go away for a time and, and get away from this um, whatever I'm facing as a parent. And I just, I need some relief. And you know, sometimes as a parent, I, we get to the point where we're just willing to do whatever it takes to bring some temporary peace so I can just breathe a little bit. And if we're honest with ourselves, we've probably all been faced with that. As we raise our children, there's, there, there, comes, there are times in our lives where we're just wanting some peace. We're just wanting a break. And at that point, we give in thinking, you know, just this once, I'll, I'll allow this or I'll, I'll give in or I'll let them have what they want to get some relief, to give them their way uh, to uh, step back from the pressure that we're facing. Turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. This morning is a, another child training message, the fifth one, and it's keys to training. The keys to training. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is a message given to the, um, the children of Israel as they're getting ready to go into the promised land, and they're given instructions um, of how they should live, how they should 
how their lives should be presented to the people around them, how they should lead their children, and how they should teach them. And so I want to draw some um, comparisons out of this passage for us so we can apply it to where we're at today. If you would, please stand with me. We're going to start reading in chapter 6, verse 1 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. Now these are the commandments of the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it that it may be well with thee, that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk with them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thine house, and on thy gates. You may be seated. Sorry, I forgot to advance the slides here as we read through that. So Moses is giving, he's, the children of Israel are given instructions and how to teach their children. But before that, I'm going to skip to, okay, let's, let's look at the first two verses here. He first of all gives them instructions of how they should live. And he says that ye might do them. So he's referring to the commandments that God has given them. And he says that you might do them. And so, first of all, he's requiring that they as people do them. It has to become a part of who they are. It has to be, they have to, first of all, be fulfilling the commandments that God has given them. And then he makes another statement. He says that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee. And so, he's taking it a step further. First of all, they're supposed to do them, but he says that, also requiring it that they would fear God, that they would fear the Lord. You know, there are times that we can, we can fulfill, we can do certain things just out of knowing that we need to do them. And then there's a second part of that when we start doing them because we actually fear God. We actually have a respect for who God is, for what he's asking of us. And it's because of that that I do what I'm asked to do. So now there's, now there's reason to do it. And it's important that we as parents, that that is why we're, that's why we're teaching, that's why we're doing what we're doing. It's, it's why we're following God's commandments is because, because we respect the Lord. It's because we have a healthy fear of who He is. And it's out of that that we, that we live our lives. It's out of that that we teach our children. So it's, it's referring here to a genuineness of heart, not just requiring things of our children, but doing it because it's, I actually believe it. I actually have a respect for God. And so I have three points this morning for us as parents that I think will give us direction as we teach our children. The first one is genuineness, teaching out of who I am in Christ, being genuine giving direction to our children and, and teaching them because there's, there's something in me that has changed. There's, there's something in my heart that has changed. There's a fear that I have of God. And because of that, I am now teaching you as my child to respect God, to respect the authority, to respect me as an authority, to respect other authorities that are in my child's life. It's important that we as parents are genuine Parents need to know what they believe and why they believe it if they plan to pass on their beliefs to their children. 
In this passage, it talks about passing it on to our children and to our children's children. And I think if we would, if we would take a raise of hands, all of us would say, well, it's important to us that, that what, I, what, what, God, what I believe God has for me, what he has required of me, that I want to pass that to my children. And then I want to pass it on to my, my children's children. But if we're going to do that, it needs to come out of a genuine heart. I need to understand what's being required of me. I need to, be, I need to understand what, what God wants from me. And then out of that, I'm able to teach my children and to lead them. You know, God was very concerned about the Israelites that when they got to the promised land that they would forget. And later on in this chapter, just several verses um, past what we read here, it says, he says, beware lest you forget. Beware lest you forget what I've asked of you and you regress. And I think we as parents could take the same warning. We need to be aware that we so easily forget what's being required of us, what God holds us accountable for as a parent. And so it's, it's, it's easy to, to forget uh, where we're going, who we're following, and why we're doing it. So being genuine, teaching out of who I am in Christ... In Matthew chapter 12, there are several verses there, and I'm not going to read the, the whole passage, but it's talking about um, the words that we say, and it's, it's warning us that we need to be aware of what comes out of our mouth. And he makes an um, interesting statement in that passage in Matthew chapter 12, and he says, O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. And I think as parents, what's inside of us, who we are, is what comes out. It's, it's what our, our children are going to learn. It doesn't necessarily, although what I say to them is important, who I am is going to affect them more than what I say. Don't get me wrong. I think it's important that we verbally teach. But it, that verbal teaching should come out of who I am in Christ, wh what I'm living out of, who God is, how that has affected me. It's, it's then that I can, I can affect my children in a positive way. A good tree bringeth forth good things. An evil tree bringeth forth evil things. The, what's inside of me is going to come out. My, my children will understand. They will know who I really am, who I truly am, no matter what I say. So being genuine. The second one is our attitude. And our attitude trumps techniques. And I'm referring to, as parents, our attitude, okay? Our attitude in teaching trumps uh, techniques. And when I'm referring to techniques, I'm saying there are probably different ways to train our children. But my attitude is, is, the, is more important than, than teaching them in a certain way. Our attitude flows out. It's the idea of, of having that, that being that tree or, or having that heart that's filled with good or evil things. That is what flows out. And our attitude flows out also. Referring back to Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse, I think it's verse 5. Let me turn to that quickly. He says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. You know, it's impossible to love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might, and not have it change who we are. It's impossible because when God is, when God is in me, when God has filled me up, when I'm, when I'm living out of a heart that's so full of God... It affects the way I look at life. It affects the way I look at other people. It affects my attitude at home. It affects my attitude at church. There's a change in who I am. And my children, 
the people I probably spend the most time with can quickly tell if I'm filled up with God. They can quickly tell if I'm full of His Spirit, if His Spirit is, is just oozing out of me, if it's, if it's changed who I am, or if it hasn't. They can quickly tell that. It, they're aware of the attitude that I have. And as parents, I think it's important that we have the right uh, focus and goals, but more importantly, that our attitude as we teach them is correct. We teach out of what is in our heart. You know, sometimes we have, in the middle of, of training and teaching, and, and, um, and when, I, when I say that, I'm just referring to normal life, okay? So you wake up tomorrow morning, Monday morning, and you have wash to do, and you start, you start your busy day. And that is, we are, we are training our children every day that the sun comes up. We are training them. And so it's not a time separate from normal life. There are times to be, um, maybe have specific things that we teach them. But as we live life, we are training our children. They are, they are learning from us. And sometimes we become frustrated. And I think sometimes for myself, um, when I allow continued disobedience in my children, it begins to affect my attitude, even though I don't want it to. Because I begin to get frustrated that they don't listen, and it, it begins to wear me down. And so suddenly, um, my Monday morning started out pretty good, but because I'm just not willing to deal with, with uh, the children and, and some of the, maybe the attitudes that they have, it begins to wear me down. And so suddenly now, my attitude has changed from a positive attitude. I've allowed them, because I've allowed them to be disobedient, they affect my attitude. And so now I'm, I'm operating out of an attitude of frustration. And I wonder sometimes if, if we're maybe uh, more to blame for um, the attitudes that we struggle with than our children are, because we allow them to affect our attitude. And our children realize that frustration. I'd like to look at different attitudes, maybe correct attitudes and incorrect attitudes. And I, and I got uh, these out of the book, John Koblenz's book, uh, Christian Family Living. He has some good basic uh, teaching of how to raise uh, families, and I've appreciated his book. But in there, he had a list of correct attitudes versus incorrect attitudes. And the first one he lists is a calm, quiet spirit versus a uh, spirit of irritation or just being irritated. And, and I wonder if sometimes our spirit of irritation, we, if we could uh, avoid that, if I was willing to deal with problems before they really get out of hand. And so sometimes uh, something comes up in our children and, and I tend to think, well, uh, surely it'll just, it'll go away. They'll take care of it themselves or they'll, they'll get past it. And so I allow it to build up and um, it, it begins to affect their attitude because uh, now they're, they have this self-centered attitude and, and then I get frustrated with it and it, it just kind of, it ends up getting to be a bigger thing than it would have to be if I would be willing to deal with it immediately. And it would help keep my spirit calmer, probably keep them in a better place if I was willing to deal with it instead of allow it and then it turns into an irritation. The second one is respect the child versus disgust for the child. I think it's important that we remember that children are made in God's image. They are. They are made in his image and we should appreciate them for who they are. We should appreciate them for how God made them. The second part of that is that we also need to remember that this child has a sin nature. They are living out of a sin nature. There is, uh, Christ has not filled their hearts yet and changed their lives. They are in that process of being changed, of becoming aware that they need a Savior. And so we as parents, our responsibility is to help them see that there is a sin nature being demonstrated in the way that they live their lives, how they, how they act and how they respond and we should be teaching them to see that. And so it's important that we have a correct um, respect for them and not a disgust for, oh, I just can't believe that you do that. But instead, just realizing that there's a sin nature here that I'm dealing with and being aware of it. 
and dealing with it. The third one is gentleness with firmness versus harshness and roughness. How do I interact with my children? Am I gentle with them? Am I firm but gentle? Am I, am I clear or do I, uh, do I lead them? Do I give them direction in a, in a harsh and rough manner? And some of us, I think, we've, we've grown up maybe more under that type of child training where um, it's, it, we maybe didn't hear anything from our parents and then suddenly they were done and, and the ball, you know, the, the ball dropped and we're going to end this right now. And so they, they get in the car, we're, you know, we're this or that. And so dad all of a sudden takes charge and, and, uh, and I, I find myself sometimes doing that exact thing because I didn't deal with the situation when I should have. But that can be our tendency sometimes is to, to train our children and to try to give them instruction in a harsh way. And I think we need to be careful because we, when we do that, we begin to train our children that, well, dad's not serious. Dad's not serious. Dad's not serious. Okay, now dad's harsh. Oh, I better pay attention because dad's getting right to the end of his rope and just pretty soon he's going to really mean what he says. And so we begin to train them to think that, oh, it's, Dad doesn't really meet it until he says it or he, he really takes the bull by the horn and now, he's, now he must mean it. And there's another thing that I'm concerned about when we train out of that, when we have that type of a training is that, you know, often the way I look at my Heavenly Father, the way I view God is how I have viewed my Father growing up. Think about that for a moment. What's your picture of God is your picture of God a God that is so loving that he, 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 would, never, he would never require anything of me because he, he loves me so much that he, I'm his child? Possibly comes from a father who was just allowed anything to happen versus the other side of that is a father that is harsh. Suddenly a, a growing up, I see myself seeing God as a very a harsh God, a, a just God, a God who is not approachable, a God who requires a lot of me, a God who's demanding, a God who is thunder and, and fire and, and that type of a, a God. And sometimes we, we get that picture because of how our father related to us. And when I think of that, it, it's concerning to me when I think about my children and, and what is their view of God going to be if they view Him the same way that they view me? What type of father am I? Am I a father that is, is firm and is gentle? Or am I a father that is harsh? How do they see me? What is my attitude towards them? Using controlled tones versus loud, exasperated tones. I think it's important that we speak in normal tones to our children. And we train ourselves as parents to do this at a young age. And for some reason, when you're talking to a baby, we just really have to talk babyish to them. And if we don't watch it, we can, we can, start, doing, we can start using those tones all the way up as they grow older. And I think it's important that um, as parents that we talk in normal tones to our children, that when we're giving them instruction, we should just talk in a normal tone. There's no reason to have to tell them that from now on, pretty soon they start watching for that tone and they can quickly decide that, oh, dad doesn't mean it until he hits that tone, right? So even, even, our, even the way we do it, so not being harsh, being gentle, but also our, the tone that we use uh, conveys a lot to our children. So just in a normal tone, giving them instructions and uh, asking them to do something, and uh, they understand that doesn't uh, dad's normal tone uh, means obedience the same as um, if he were to speak in a higher tone. The last one, having confidence versus hopelessness. Asking something of our children, asking them uh, to obey something, and to expect them to obey it, rather than wondering, hmm, 
are they going to do it this time? As parents, I think we should, we should ask them with expectation. Just expecting that it's going to happen. And then if it doesn't, we're surprised because we expected it to be followed through. We expected that they were going to, to obey. Having confidence. You know, sometimes as parents, uh, we can exclaim to others that, you know, we just don't know why our children don't listen. We just don't understand. Um, and sometimes I've even seen that or experienced it or maybe even done it myself where we do that in front of our children where we're just, you know, we just exclaiming to another, uh, to our friends or something that, yeah, we just, we don't know why our children don't listen. Just, just kind of like, I don't know what to do. Um, do I have confidence when I ask them to do something? Do I have confidence that they will obey? Do I expect it of them? So those are different attitudes, uh, correct attitudes versus incorrect attitudes that we can have. The third thing is, so first of all, genuineness. The second one is attitude. The third one is consistency. Requiring the same thing repeatedly. Having consistency in our teaching. Looking at the scripture that we read, verses 7 through 9, it says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. So when you're at home, and when thou walkest in the way, when you're not at home. And when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and thou shalt be as frontlet, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. There's not a lot of free time, if you will, in child training, if we're following this direction. It's when we're at home, it's when we're gone. It's when we're awake, it's when we're sleeping, or maybe before we're getting ready to sleep. Um, child training is is it's never ending. And that's why it's, it's, that's why it's so daunting. That's why it, it wears us out. And that's sometimes why as, as parents, our, our, our ropes are pretty short, right? Because it's, it's, we just, sometimes we feel like we need a break. But it is, it is a never ending job. It's a job that it takes a lot of effort. But it's important that we consistently do it. It's important that it happens when we're at home, when we're gone, when we're, when we're here, when we're there, that we're, we're constantly finding ways to teach them. We're constantly finding ways to be an example to them. We're, 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 we're observing something in someone else, and we're telling our children, did you observe that? That was a good thing. That was a positive thing, what that person did. So using things like that to teach them, or, or making observations of, of just other children even in, in their obedience and saying, did you see how they responded? Thank you for doing that. We, 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 we appreciate when you do that. So giving them positive input, uh, giving them, uh, uh, helping them understand when they do something correctly. I think sometimes our consistency in training is often reflected in our child's willingness to obey immediately. So if we find our children not being willing to obey, maybe it's not necessarily that they don't understand what they've been asked to do. It's my, as a parent, it's maybe my lack of consistency in asking that of them. Because when a child knows what they're to do, or they, when they know where the line is, and when, they, and when it's clear and they know when they cross it, they then learn to respect the line. If the line doesn't move, but they know that the line is always here, they learn to respect that. But they also quickly learn that when that line moves, depending on mom or dad's attitude, depending on where we're at, depending on um, how tired mom or dad is, when they understand that that line is movable, depending on that, it becomes a new game. The game is how quickly can I wear mom and dad down so that that line moves to where I want it. And children will win that game every time. Because they soon learn if they can get that line to move, it worked last time. I just need to be more persistent till mom moves the line or till dad moves the line or till dad says, yeah, go ahead. 
because he's tired of it. So it quickly becomes a game for them, and they're good at it. You know, some, I wonder if maybe one of the hardest parts of training children sometimes is training us as parents. I find it that way sometimes. Sometimes it's, it's, it's harder for me to be consistent, to have that attitude, and to be um, genuine. It's harder for me to do that, to be that person, than it is for them to learn to be obedient. Maybe the title of the message should have been Keys to Training Parents. I'm not sure. Maybe sometimes it's harder to train us as parents. Overall, a few things that I think help us as parents is a loving attitude with clear expectations are essential to raising godly children. You know, a child's behavior pattern, what we see as a little child, how they respond to obe- how they respond to being asked to do things, their attitude, their uh, just who they are and being a, a joyful child, that, that tends to follow them through adulthood. Maybe in varying degrees. It may change. I'm not saying God can't change us, but de- de- who they are as a child and growing up and some of the, the things that they develop at a young age often tend to follow them through their adult years. And, you know, God is, in, God is in the process of changing us as people. As those, as those young children grow up, God wants to change them. He wants to change me. He wants to change all of us. But as parents, our responsibility as we raise these children is to raise them as God wants them to be raised. So, instilling godly principles in their lives and, and helping them understand what is, it is a correct attitude. And so it's, it's our responsibility as parents to teach that because they're small children. They don't understand it. And hopefully as they grow older, they begin to develop those things. And at some point, the Holy Spirit begins to work in their heart. The Holy Spirit begins to work in their lives and begins to help them change. And he, he can do a much better job than we can as parents. But it's important that we begin that development process that children learn to they learn to look at their heavenly father and see him as a ultimate goal. They, they see God as, as, that's who I want to be. That's who I want to look like. And yes, my parents have helped me look like him because that was their focus. And so we begin to point them in that, that direction. It's our responsibility. God holds us responsible to do that. Maybe some of you who are older and have raised your children, you sit in child training classes or messages and you think, well, it's too late. My time is past. My children are growing. And I have a few things for you this morning. So young parents, you can tune out for a little bit. But I'm going to refer this to you observers who are now on the other side of child training and you're, you're observing um, your children raising their 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 children. You're observing other families in church raising their children. And I just want to call you to a few things. The first one is encourage them. Be a source of encouragement. It's so easy, we so quickly forget the stresses of having little children. And when we're in the middle of it, we think there's just no way we're going to forget this. But we tend to forget the persistent nagging and, the, and the, the, everything that goes on with having young children. And, and as we grow older and we get past that stage, we tend to forget. And so share encouragement to our young families. When you see parents teaching godly principles, when you see them being consistent, commend them on it. And I don't know, is, that, is it hard for us as, as Anabaptists to do that? But I think it would be so encouraging to our young families, if some of those, uh, some of you who have went through it could go to them and say, you know what, I saw what happened this morning in church, and you may have been embarrassed by whatever happened, but 
I just bless you as a father. I, I saw what you did, how you handled that, and you did a good job. And I appreciate that about you. Or I, I see you consistently doing this with your children. Looks like you've got your hands full, but here's what I see. I see you every Sunday, you're, you're consistently teaching. That would be such an encouragement to our young families if they would hear that from you. Be an encouragement to them. Be patient with them. There's a reason we call it child training and not just child teaching. Some years ago, I worked at uh, Pollywood in Syracuse for several winters and uh, helped make poly outdoor furniture. And there were several products that they sold that had, um, like on a rocker where it had a bent back piece, a slat that would fit to your back, or a swing that would have a, a single bend. And then what they would do is they would take a piece of poly that was straight and was flat, and they would cut it to length, and they would route the edges, and they would get that piece all formed, ready to go in the swing or whatever it was supposed to go into. And then they had these ovens. And they would, we'd stick them in the ovens, and we would turn the ovens on. And we would heat that piece to a certain point. And it was important that the piece got heated correctly. So if you overheated it, it was, you know, it was going to be all limp and it, and it, it lost its, its strength. But if it wasn't heated enough, it, it wasn't pliable. And so we'd heat those to a certain temperature. And then they had these form boards that had pegs in them. And we would take that piece and we would bend it around the pegs. And we would leave them in there. And then we'd often place them over and a fan would blow over it. And these, they would sit in that, that form until they were cooled off. And if you took them out of that form too quickly, they would begin to straighten out. And yeah, they would, they would maybe have a little bit of the form, but it wasn't the correct form. But if you left them in there the proper amount of time, they eventually, you know, they, would, they would cool off and they would take on that form. And child training is a, light, a lot like that. It just, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. And our young families are in the middle of that training. Can we be patient with them? And so there are going to be times when we're in a church service and there's a child that's loud. And, and I've observed this. And so I'll just, as if you're used to having your house quiet all the time, a crying child can really be annoying. And... Um, and as young parents, sometimes we're not quite sure what to do, okay? We're not sure should we take the child out immediately um, or should we keep them in and deal with it. But it, it doesn't help when we're getting stares from the front. And so I just encourage you as older people, be, be patient. Um, encourage them. But it is a training process. Those pieces are still in the mold. They're still, they're still cooling off, okay? They're still being shaped. Can we be patient and encourage and allow the training to happen? And give advice. And here's my, my tip to give advice. You know, I'm always encouraged when I receive advice from somebody, especially when they've, when they've been through it, and they come and say, you know what? Here's something that... I remember as a father that I faced and I failed. And here's something I wish I could do different. And I just want to share this with you. And, and being, being real, being real enough to share as an older person that, you know what, I made some mistakes. And here's, here's one mistake that I think I made. And I just encourage you as a young parent to not make that same mistake. Learn from what I, learn from my mistakes. Don't, don't relive the mistakes that I made. But, but, I just encourage you to, to do this. this. This may be of help to you. So encourage them in that way. To you young parents, in the middle of it, don't give up. Keep applying the pressures to that piece that's being formed. Keep them in the racks to cool. Keep them in, in the place of training. Keep them there. Be patient. Don't lose hope. Pray. Avail yourself of prayer. I think God wants to give us um, direction, wants to give us the courage, wants to give us um, the strength that we need each day. And so pray for that specifically. Pray that God would fill us. 
pray that God would give us wisdom as parents. Ask others. There's a lot of people who have done the same thing. There's a lot of people in church. There's a lot of people around you who are facing the same things. As parents, I always, I enjoy talking with other parents that have children our age because as we begin to talk, we're like, well, what I'm facing is a little bit different, but there's, there are some similarities. And so we do face a lot of the same things. So ask other people, how do you find it? How are you dealing with this situation? Do you have any advice for me? This is what we're facing. Ask, learn from others. Be intentional. Be intentional. Take the time to do it and to do it right. I believe God has given us the tools and the energy as parents to raise godly children. I I believe that we have all of that. There are days that we feel like I don't have the energy. energy. There are times where we get frustrated or we get to the bottom of the barrel and we just say, I don't know how to do this. I don't have any answers. And in those times, I just encourage you to be genuine, have the right attitude, and be consistent. Make sure that what you're doing is, 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 being, is reflecting God through you and just keep doing it. But be intentional, be consistent with your training. And it does take a lot of patience and consistency. But be faithful. Be faithful. Let's kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning. Lord, thank you for the children that you've blessed us with. Lord, I pray that you would help us as parents to have hearts that are turned towards you. Lord, give us patience and fill us with wisdom that we could raise these children, Lord, uh, that you've given to us, that we could raise them to reflect who you are and that uh, you working through our hearts uh, would be effective in their hearts, Lord, and that it would change them. Lord, help us to be consistent. And Lord, I pray that as we raise our children, that they would go out from our homes, that they would go out from this church, out from this community, And Lord, that they would affect others around us for your kingdom. That they would be a positive influence to those that they come in contact with, Lord. And that you would receive.